Al Jazeera podcast. It all started as a typical building job. On October 5th, this is what Yumna Al Sayed was reporting on for Al Jazeera. Bulldozers were working on the construction of a residential project in the Jabalia neighborhood of North A construction Africa. project that, when uncovered, exposed Roman ruins dating back 2,000 years. They soon discovered a piece of history that has astonished archaeologists and historians. Two days later, Hamas fighters breached Israel's fortress-like border fence in an attack that left 1,400 dead and hundreds more taken captive. Hamas militants launched an unprecedented and large-scale surprise attack targeting dozens of locations in Israel. Right now, Israel This was Yumna on October 7th. Air raids are shaking the Gaza Strip. Here in Gaza City, many neighborhoods uh, have been targeted, many civilian homes. The last targeting was for... It's been a month and a day since the war on Gaza began. A month that's changed Gaza and could change the world forever. Al Jazeera journalists have been recording voice memos and updating us day by day, trying to answer so many new questions about what it's like to work, to keep their families alive, to survive. And this question, when will this end? And what will be left of Gaza then? I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. This was live on air on Al Jazeera on October 7th. What can you report at this stage? (laughs) All right. Yumna. While Yumna was reporting from Gaza City, an Israeli airstrike hit the tower directly behind her. If you are in a position to do so safely, you can explain to us what we're happening. If you are not in a position to do so safely, Yumna kept going. No, it's okay. Um, this is a missile attack on on Palestine Tower, right in the middle of Gaza City. By October 8th, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was telling the Palestinians in Gaza to leave. But the crossing into Israel is sealed. The crossing into Egypt is sealed. For the vast majority of the 2.3 million people in Gaza, leaving was never an option. Well, this was a scene just a few hours ago when Israel launched another airstrike on Gaza. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has warned people in Gaza who are under Israel's land, air and sea blockade to leave the territory. So for the past month, Yumna did the only thing she could do, kept reporting. Yes, well... The violent Israeli raids have not stopped bombarding across the Gaza Strip in different areas, causing great amounts of casualties, including the entire families of those uh, residents of that home. Wednesday 11th, 7 a.m. in the morning, Gaza local time. This is the fifth day of the war. We woke up today to the sounds of bombardments that continued all night. After those initial days of non-stop live reporting, Yumna started sending the take voice memos. She lives in Gaza City with her husband, one son, and three daughters. Juju, what scares you the most? Honestly, the bombardments. The cats start to chase me so much. Her voice memos aren't always regular, but when she can, she lets us know what's been going on. We just witnessed a massive bombardment now. I took my kids quickly under the bar of the kitchen. They're sitting there now. The smoke in the home is terrible (coughs) because of the fire. Along with the bombardments came Israel's siege. 
no more fuel, water, or food was allowed into Gaza. But for those first few days, there was still some water in the pipes. It hadn't completely run out until that morning. I woke up, I found no water in the taps anymore. What was left was the water that was already stored in Gaza. And they literally finished in two days. Since yesterday, Gaza is suffering deficit in electricity, so we have no electricity. Luckily, in my home, I use solar energy panels, so I'm still able to have electricity. Other homes now don't. I don't know how my kids will wake up without water now. The kids are sleeping now and I don't even want to wake them up. I don't want them to be afraid. Yumna wasn't alone thinking about her family. Now and then, oh, when the Israelis bombard or when we hear the explosions while I'm in the office, uh, I call my family, I call my daughters, my kids. Safwat al Gahlut was reporting from Al Jazeera from Gaza City at that time, too. And try to explain them that, uh, you know, they are not targeted and try to calm them down. Which wasn't easy when he was moving offices because of the Israeli airstrikes, sometimes several times a day. Maybe it's like funny or a project, but funny. We have relocated in three different uh, places in one day. First, the Al Jazeera Bureau, his usual office. Then we moved to our way, uh, to Plan B, uh, uh, the second bureau that we have. Then the Plan B was ruined because the next building was also destroyed. Uh, so we moved to Plan C, which is the, one of the hotels. They put their luggage down, stored what they could. And in a few hours, there was a threat to the hotel also to evacuate. So we became like goats in the field, carrying luggages, carrying equipment and running from a place to another. We didn't stop reporting despite all these obstacles, all these threats. I felt really happy. I was really happy despite everything. We managed to keep or continue reporting and to tell the truth. For Safwat and the other Al Jazeera journalists, there was no choice but to continue. Thursday, 12th October. I had to leave home today under the ongoing bombardment to get to the office. I'm on my way now. All I can see in the streets are destroyed buildings, glass shattered everywhere. The streets no longer really look like they used to anymore. I don't even know the neighborhoods now. No one is in the street. Everything is closed. And yet, the bombardment is still going on. I'm asking myself just one question now. If we do survive this war, how will we ever be able to live in Gaza again? What will be left? So long, Gaza. So long. The next day, Israel made an announcement. That's after the break. Al Jazeera's correspondent, Yomna Al Sayed, has been sending us voice memos since the war on Gaza began. 13th October, 3 a.m. in the morning. We just got a text message 
saying that the people of Gaza city should evacuate their homes quickly to the south. Israel has now warned 1.1 million Palestinians to move south for their own safety. If this is true, that means that tomorrow morning we need to leave. I'm just looking around. What can I carry for four kids? It's so difficult to imagine your home might be in danger. I still can't take a decision. Eventually, Yumna made the decision to drive away. At least if something happens, we're going to be conscious free that we followed every instruction and we did everything that we could to keep our kids safe. Although the trip was very risky and the bombardment was ongoing, we got to Khan Yunus safely, thank goodness, and um, we're there now. She was also reporting on what was happening to her as it was unfolding. Yumna, are you okay? I'm okay, but the situation is extremely terrible. I could gather whatever I could gather in just a few hours for my children, and all the families the same. It's not just me. Saturday, 14th October. I had to open the calendar to check what day it is. I feel like I've totally lost count of days and time. We're still trapped here in Khan Yunis with other families. And the situation is just getting worse and worse. Thousands of people are still trying to get to Khan Yunis. It's like we're being trapped in one place so that we're all bombarded together. But there were still airstrikes all around her. Yesterday and all night and today in the morning, the bombardments did not stop. So many families who have evacuated south are going back now because at least, at least, um, if we're going to die, we're going to die with dignity in our homes. After just five nights in Khan Yunus, she and her family headed back. So we're here on Salah Street, heading back to Gaza City. We've started entering the neighborhood. So we were really worried, honestly, to take this journey back home. But uh, alhamdulillah, thank God, we made it back home safely me and the kids. Twentieth October one thirty AM We woke up on these sounds of explosions and strong airstrikes. Very violent. Everyone woke up on the sound. I tried to comfort my kids, to put them back to sleep. Later, Yumna talked to her daughter, Juri, about the airstrikes and what she was experiencing. Does that scare you? The big bombardments. So much. For example, this one didn't scare me, but the bigger ones scare me. Jury told her about what it's like as a kid without water and electricity, and what she misses from school. You don't get scared in my arms, right? No, not at all. No, just a little bit. When I'm in your arms, I only get a little scared. But when I'm not in your arms, I get very scared. You will always be in my arms. Right. Then, a few days later, Yumna sat down with her daughter again. 
ليش زعلانة أنت؟ Why are you sad? <تصفيق> ليه عم تبكي جوجو؟ ما بنكذب لبعمل ما تخافي ما تخافي يا روحي Don't be scared إن شاء الله رح يخلص It will finish <تصفيق> أنا كتير بحبك I love you ولا I won't go to work. I'll stay with you. It's okay, mommy. It's okay. It's okay, Anna Mike. I'm here with you. Just a day later, the Israeli airstrikes hit home for Yumna and the rest of Al Jazeera. Our colleague from Al Jazeera Arabic, Wael Al Dahdu, who has been reporting on events in Gaza for a long time, has lost his wife and son and daughter as a result of the shelling of their house in Nusayrat in the central Gaza Strip. What guilt does a reporter commit when they tell the world the truth? Why should they be punished by their families? Still in Gaza City, Yumna spends a lot of her time trying to communicate with family members, just to reassure them she's there. The signal is pretty weak, but um, I can get some connection over the rooftop and uh, of the building. But on October 27th, even that ended. Last night, Israel, with very violent bombardments, cut out all communications in the Gaza Strip. Suddenly, nothing was working at all. No landlines, no internet. The Israeli ground offensive had begun. Israelis were inside Gaza now, planting their flag. After 24 hours, the connection started back up again. And as people in Gaza started to reassess, Yumna's husband got a call. She explained what happened on Al Jazeera. Yumna, a number of people have been receiving messages from the Israeli army warning them to leave the area. Yes, the phone call that we received was from a private number. He literally said, uh, he, he, he gave my husband full name and told him that this is the Israeli army. We are telling you to evacuate south because in the coming hours, it's going to be very dangerous in the area where you are. So, of course, Yumna and her family started thinking about leaving again. But they can't do that either, she said. We've been hearing the past days and seeing videos of cars, million cars that were uh, directly targeted while they were on the street going to the south. And this has happened many times. So I don't think if I risk uh, my life and the life of my kids to take this journey now, this could be a, a, a right decision. We didn't get a voice memo from Yumna for a few days after that, but we did hear from our colleague Safwat. What we used to do in the past, like showering, washing, watching TV, surfing internet, eating uh, lasagna, pasta shoota, spaghetti, couscous, this became like luxury, you know? Washing yourself, what? 
بس يعني <تصفيق> واو ما شاء الله You know, you, you used to take a shower every day. Now, no, once a week is like, mashallah, this is luxury. I bought an uh, electrical bike, so I move with the bicycle. You know, uh, the fuel is life now in Gaza. No electricity, no cars, no transportation. Now people are still using the fuel that they have been saving before the war, because in Gaza, Everybody has plan B. So myself, I'm using the electrical bike and charge it, and that's it. His daughter, Malika Al-Kahlout, wanted to talk to us too. I am 21 years old. I am in my third year at university. I'm studying computer engineering, and I want to be a graphic designer. But right now, she's praying her friends are alive. She wants this war to end. And spend the time with my family, not being afraid of losing any one of them, especially my hero dad who goes to the work even if it's not safe for him. Now, in Gaza, nowhere is safe. We next got a voice memo from Yumna on Saturday, November 4th, The Israeli military says that it will allow Palestinian evacuees to use the main Gaza highway south between 11 GMT and 1400 GMT on Saturday. According to the Israeli army, they sent us a statement saying that people can head south from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. So Yumna and her husband packed up and got the kids ready. At about 2.30, 2.15, while we were just heading out, uh, some people, some friends called us from whom they were heading south as well. They just left before us and they said that helicopters are shooting on cars and um, other cars have turned around and came back to Gaza City, so don't go out. And horrific massacre. This was the scene after Israel targeted Palestinians traveling on the Al Rashid Highway. The major road links the northern parts of the Strip to the south. The next day, Yumna was live on air again. Yumna, appreciate your professionalism in reporting this story, but if I could ask you for a personal perspective as well, because you are one of those many civilians inside. Gaza City, which we know is surrounded by Israeli forces, which we know is subjected to now uh, these attacks and strikes by Israel. Talk to us about the options that you feel you have to not only protect yourself, but your four children. We have no options, Sammy. I mean, all night we're just under bombardment. It's very violent. And we just pray that I'm sorry, Yumna. Perhaps we should let you go. We appreciate you reporting this. Yumna said they're reporting from inside Gaza City. And on the one month mark of this war on Gaza, Yumna sent us one more update. It's been over a month now, and nothing, nothing seems like it's coming to an end. And that's the most frustrating and depressing part about it. The look of despair I saw in children's eyes in a Shifa hospital, in Nasser hospital. And now I see the same look of despair in my children's eyes. It just kills me. And that's The Take. We're dedicating this story to our brave journalists everywhere, but especially our colleagues and their families in the Gaza Strip. Special thanks to Iman Jan Mohammed Rashid and Shinaz Jan Mohammed. This episode was produced by Amy Walters with Chloe K. Lee, David Enders, Faranisa Campana, Khaled Sultan, Miranda Lynn, Natasha Del Toro, Sari Al-Khalili, Sonia Bagat, 
Zena Badr, and me, Malika Bilal. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. The Take's executive producer is Alexandra Locke, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back.